My mum is from Switzerland. My birth dad's actually from the Congo. And then I've got my stepdad who's Australian. Because I moved to Australia when I was eight. So how long did it take you to learn English? I know after a year I was fluent. I remember the first time I dreamt in English and I remember the oh, first time. Oh wow. Yeah. That's it. That's, I think I haven't ever yeah. considered yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> But I really did let go of all the expectations of will it become big or will it be this or will people like it? When I started, I was a little bit in that mindset. Lately, I've really been kind of letting go of all that and just being like, no, do you like this song? Release your music because we only have one life. So, you know, what's the point of keeping it? You know, like some people can keep it if they don't want to share it, of course. But I think I always wanted to share my music. When I'm releasing a song and when I'm prom promoting it, I'm like kind of taken back into that song because my focus is on it and I'm creating content to promote it. So then when I'm like doing that, but then I'm also the next day in the studio mm. making a new song, it's hard for me to feel connected to both. Tell me when we've started recording. Have we started? We have started yeah, recording. Okay, but so you're going to cut it, so it's okay. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, do, we do edit. <laughs> okay. So if there's anything that you say or we ask and you'd go actually... Take that out. I shouldn't have announced my brand new album. <laughs> um, then let us know. We can cut it out. Okay, cool. However, we do like the organic starts to the, uh, to the conversation. So oh, sometimes okay. it'll just be, yeah, I don't know where we'll cut it in. There we'll will be a cut, somewhere. but there will be something about... Something that we've already spoken about yeah. coming in, so. Okay, cool. Maybe the mic falling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amy did a mic drop. A li literal mic drop. And they didn't walk out. It just kept sitting there, which is kind of weird. Right at the start. Yeah. Was, yeah. You don't yeah. often get a mic drop at the start of a gig. It's so interpretive. You haven't, you haven't proved yourself yet, mate. Let's yeah. just. <laughs> Speaking of gigging, I guess, if we can start there. We are joined now by one of the most prolific giggers around the Central <laughs> Coast, Thalia. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You um. Thank you to you guys for having me. No, thank you for coming in, and th thank you for finding us. We yes, <laughs> you had, you had a little bit of challenges finding <laughs> Sonora Studios here in Tugger, which we are doing this podcast out of. Once again, thank you to Jack Negro, who owns and runs the studios here. But I mentioned just then that you do a lot of gigging, yeah, around the the coast. A lot of sort of cover gigs at you know pubs and yeah. that sort of stuff. How do you find that? Oh, I love it, actually. It's so much fun. Do you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the voice, it can be a little bit demanding, but I feel like it's made my voice stronger uh, over time, which is great. Because, like, I remember, like, a couple of years ago, I couldn't even get through 10 songs without my voice feeling fatigued. And from doing, like, three-hour gigs now, I can tell it's actually helping my voice get stronger. Mm. But, yeah, the atmospheres are fun. You get to meet so many different people. You get, like, everyone's just always, it's always... Most of the time, depends on the places, I guess, but most of the time everyone's always in a good mood, happy, singing along. So, yeah, no, I really like it. And do you look at, I feel like we mentioned Taylor Swift a lot for an Australian really? music <laughs> show. But hey, like, she's pretty hard to ignore. She's, to yeah, she's like the biggest artist in the world right now. That, that is very true. <laughs> but I, I watched her Eras tour. I'll be your host this evening. My name is Taylor and welcome to the Eras tour. on Disney Plus. Yeah. Not sponsored, but shout out. I saw it in the movies, so. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, what? So you went to the cinema? Yeah, my friend, I wasn't going to go because I was like, oh, you either love her or hate her. I've realised people don't really, there's no in between that much. And I was like, oh, I don't know out of my friends who's going to really like her. So, you know, I didn't really ask anyone to go see. So you're a fan? I, yes. I, it's funny how ashamed I am to say that. <laughs> no, I hate her. <laughs> Because I feel like most people are like, Taylor Swift, especially my age. But yeah, no, I think she's, a, I don't love like all her songs, but she's got so many songs anyways. It's like, but like, I think she's an amazing songwriter and there are a lot of yeah. songs that I love. Yeah. For sure. I feel like you can't, and, and we are really already derailed our own podcast <laughs> This happens. Here, but mm -hmm. you have to have respect for an artist who achieves that. It's mm -hmm. not, yeah. you, can't, you can't not be good and reach it's, those heights. It's, that's it's what not I possible. Always, yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Like, I'm like, well, she must be doing something right exactly because she's like doing amazing yeah I, I think people have sort of moved into that you know you said you love her or you hate her. i feel like a lot of people now have moved into that respect her mm -hmm. round even though That's if i true. don't like her music or like her i certainly respect that she's a solo female musician dominating yeah. the world oh mm. yeah that's so yeah oh and i think she's super inspiring as well with everything she's like accomplished like mm. 
she's also a genius in just the way she handles business and challenges and yeah. Yeah, anyways, I do like her. Anyway, cool. the reason I bring up Taylor Swift, <laughs> she's cool. I saw the Eras tour and she's yeah. doing a three hour, three and a half hour mm-hmm. even live show. Mm-hmm. Choreography, dancing, yeah. singing the whole lot, like playing guitar. I'm yeah. like, well, oh, I yeah. work eight hours every day, so that sounds easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I kid. But I, I guess for something like that, obviously she's built up to that point, mm-hmm. but you're obviously at the other end where you are building up and you've said you've noticed your voice sort of improving as a result but i was watching taylor swift and going Mm -hmm. the cardio fitness that you have to have to be able to do that let alone like singing and before like it just well i read she did an interview or something with a magazine and i read the newspaper magazine whatever it was and she said uh, yeah she had to train like hours like on the treadmill she would sing and run on the treadmill (laughs) i can't even make a phone call and walk (laughs) (laughs) same i'm like out of breath (laughs) yeah (laughs) like sorry i'm just on a walk right now (laughs) yeah so that is some accomplishment do you throw any taylor swift covered songs into your your gigs yeah i do well i get a lot of um whenever there's like kids around and i always ask like do you have any requests and um, most of them like 90% of the time they request Taylor Swift. So I always play like Love Story. Nice. Yeah. Classic. You know, like the requesting, I've always looked at that and thought, that's ballsy. I was going to say, do you get nervous? If you get a room full of people and they have requests and you're like, sorry, I don't. Like obviously you have to know the song that they're yeah. requesting. Oh, I always say, if I know it, I'll do it. But if I don't know it, I, you know. But there has been a few times where like I have gotten requests and I didn't, like I knew the song but didn't know how to, had to never played it before, like literally last night. Someone requested 20 Good Reasons by yeah. Ferris Merrick, and I love that song, but I just have never played it before. I don't know why. I was like, yeah, okay. I searched up the chords, and um, I just gave it a go, and it actually went pretty well. So sometimes I give it a go. That's, like, that's the so mark you're of sort a of talented <laughs> musician. Yeah. yeah. You're reading and playing the chords on the yeah. fly. I was yeah. going to say, your other option is you can do, again, tell us with reference, do a Zalia's version and, <laughs> yeah, and be true. like, these four chords are generally good for any pop song. Let me yeah. just play these four chords and, and just muffle like, through the lyrics and it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we can deviate from the Taylor Swift on to you, but you, you're looking at artists like that right now and mm-hmm. you're obviously at the emerging stage, you're very young and emerging. Is that is someone that you draw influence from and, and kind of how, how do you see yourself watching that going on around the world and your journey now as a, as a young musician? So how, how old are you? I'm 21. A 21. 21 yeah. year old musician from the Central Coast um, emerging and looking at that. Mm-hmm. Does it influence you and inspire you? And like my music or the way I handled the industry? Both. Both. Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> Damn. You know, it's, it's interesting you've like brought it up because I have been thinking about it a lot. It does, I think, it inspires me in the way, uh, like the whole business aspect of things. I think she's so like strong businesswoman and I love that and I think that does inspire me you know me being also a businesswoman and learning the business and not just being a singer that does the songs and then let someone else hand- handle the business even though sometimes of course I have when I'm feeling lazy I'm like it'd be awesome if I just had a manager that took care of all these emails or like paperwork or whatever or contracts you know but then I'm like no actually I'd rather have control of my career and knowing everything that is going on behind the scenes mm. and I think it just it'd be cool as well like I feel like if I know the business side of things it open, opens over doors as well it doesn't just like make me just an artist like I can do other stuff as well other things within other the industry other things within the industry if I know that area as well and I think that's probably what doing pub and cover gigs quite frequently enables you to do because you're booking your own gigs yeah you're then speaking to other people who inevitably the people who put on those shows would have some sort of connection within the industry. Mm-hmm. You're learning about sound and PA. So if you yeah. want to come and, you know, be a producer, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is probably quite a valuable tool yeah. to have in your arsenal as opposed to just being told, hey, you're playing here, exactly. hey, you're going here, you're doing that. Definitely. And it's teach like teaches me a lot about resilience as well. Like when I first started, I started like looking for gigs near the end of twenty twenty two. And it took a while actually to get me, like myself regular gigs. But it just taught me like I just kept emailing, emailing, emailing. At first, like I think I emailed like 50 places. And then I was like, oh, wait, you don't email the venues, you email booking agencies. And then I went for, to the booking agency. But like I had to learn that. Like actually I didn't have anyone being like, hey, email this booking agency. They're going to get you gigs. I didn't even know that. I was just going straight to the venues. And then the venues were like, well, no, we go through 
you know mm. we don't book artists like this anymore like it, it did happen a few times where like one venue was like yeah sure you can play on friday come <laughs> along but most of the time they go through booking agencies yeah um, isn't that so i wouldn't have even thought to i would have just emailed the venue venues up. yeah that's what i as thought as well, well. <laughs> that's why our duet um hasn't been picked up much <laughs> in our pub duet plan but that is yeah. like it is interesting as an artist so like in 2024, artists have always had to do a lot, but now uh, someone like yourself, you want to take it on, you've yeah. got to do obviously all of your own promotion and mm. marketing because you have the capacity to do that via social media. You've got to yeah. book your own gigs, obviously write and produce your own music in the process. Oh, I don't produce myself though. You don't produce I yourself? I have a producer. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't think honestly like producing is the one thing I could probably never do by myself. <laughs> don't don't <It's> say never. <laughs> That's, every artist says that and then they end up doing it. But, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is so much to it. We're here at Jack Negro Studios in uh, Sonora Studios in Togo right now. And if mm -hmm. anyone listening wants to um, understand what the difference between producing and mastering and all the processes involved, there's a, a podcast and a video on our YouTube with him that explains it very, very well because there is so, so much to it. Mm -hmm. But do you feel overwhelmed by what's required of you as an artist now in order to promote yourself and, and actually get yourself out there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. But again, I feel like that teaches me things. I don't know. I always think things that are challenging are making me stronger, which sounds a bit cliche. And it's a great attitude cringe, to have. But no, but yeah, <laughs> great attitude. But it's te like, but yeah, definitely I find it overwhelming for sure. And my brain is always trying to be like, you know, telling me it'd be so much easier if I had this and if I had that. And then, you know, and then I'm just like, I realize it's my brain, like my mind just being a bit lazy and looking for easy ways out, you yeah. know, and it's like, no, well, but these things will come along when they need to come along. But it's good that you're like pushing yourself to do, yeah. And it makes you adaptable too. If you can solve the problems you have with the tools at your arsenal, mm -hmm. you can move ahead in life being adaptable as opposed to going, oh, I need this thing to be able to do this thing. Exactly. And I am a very like, like I, I have a lot of support from my family and friends and a lot of people as well in the industry that I've like been lucky enough to meet through the years now who are very supportive and who are helping me out as well. So, yeah, no, it's I'm really grateful. Like, it's fun. It's it's going good. <laughs> yeah. You, me you mentioned your family and mm -hmm. people listening might uh, pick up a hint of an accent. Yeah. yeah. A, as well. <laughs> um, Swiss family background? Yes. So my mom is from Switzerland. And then I've got my birth dad's actually from the Congo. So and Swiss half half Congolese half Swiss and then I've got my stepdad who's Australian so then I've got all family Australian family as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And do you find a lot of your resilience comes from your parents' upbringing themselves, or where where do you think that comes from? I'm actually not sure. Um, I don't know. I think I don't think it really comes from. I mean, obviously, like, I think my family yeah definitely has always tried to teach me resilience, but I think it just comes from the fact that like I've just never been okay to give up. I think, which are probably like a lot of people in the world. I think we're all going through things, but most of the time we always just, you know, push on, push through. And and musically, uh, tell us about your origins there. How did you get on, find yourself on the journey that you're on now? Well, I always loved music. I think even when I was like little, like they, we found videos of me like singing, dancing it. Like I think I always liked it. But if something sparked in me when I moved to Australia, because I moved to Australia when I was eight and... I remember like my neighbor, who's still my neighbor today, she's a singer. Like I was, I had no friends when I arrived here. So, and I was, I was brought up a only child. Like I don't, I have half sisters, but they don't live with me. So I always like grew up as an only child. And yeah, when I moved here, I was really, I wanted like friends and I was not lonely because I'm very close to my family and parents and stuff, but I wanted other kids to play around yeah, of with. of course. And um, so I literally did not speak one word of English. And then one time my mom was like, one of the girls you go to school with, she's your neighbor. And I was like, okay. And I jumped over the fence <laughs> straight up. And I was like, I'm going to go say hi. I didn't speak one word of English. They, and then I remember I had to like draw pictures to like say, explain that I was their neighbor. Wow. Because we couldn't communicate. So my neighbor, she's a... Um, her mom is a singer and she had a microphone set up and everything. And then one day I just like started singing on the microphone and then oh, then I got obsessed with singing on the microphone. And then I brought over my French like backing tracks that I have all, all these songs because I would only speak it like sing in French. And yeah, and then I just started singing over there and I became really good friends with her daughter and who I'm still friends with today. And yeah, but something 
definitely like that's when I fell in love with music and singing. Almost goes back to the bit of a cliche, but the universal, you know, language is sort of music and yeah. doesn't matter where you come from. Everyone loves music and everyone sings and mm -hmm. it's all sort of part of your origin story, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah so yeah. the connection point was music despite yeah, not even being able to communicate in the same language. Yeah. That's how I kind of, I guess, connected with them. Yeah. At first before speaking. English. So how long did it take you to learn English? Like, I mean, it feels like forever ago now because I was eight, but I think it only took me about six months to like better be able to understand. Yep. I know after a year I was fluent. Wow. But before that, wow. I just, I don't know exactly the time frame because I was too little. But I remember the little things. Like I remember the first time I understood a movie or something in English. Like I, I remember the first time I dreamt in English and I remember the oh, first. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's it. That's, I think I haven't ever yeah. considered yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> me too. That's fascinating. Yeah, like those little like accomplishments throughout the way that I'm like, oh my God. And then one time as well, because when I was little, I used to play like with pet shops and Barbies, like every girl, I guess, most girls. I remember one time I was like, oh, mom, I didn't even notice, but I, you know, played in English. Like with wow. the, yeah. <laughs> so it slowly became. It like became, yeah. And how does that, your, your background obviously would now influence your music. So mm -hmm. you have this diverse cultural background and then also a history of not speaking English until you're eight or nine years old. Yeah. How do you feel that now influences the music that you make and, and what you want to create? Well, I haven't actually written any songs in French yet, but it is something that I, I think I was being too scared to because I sp like I'm fluent in French as well, but the writing side of things... I find a bit challenging just because I didn't, I stopped going to school in French from the age of eight. So the way like I write in French, I think is different than maybe other people who went to school in French, right? So I was a bit, I think, a bit nervous to try, but definitely like lately I've been listening to a lot of music that mixed the two and I've been finding it so cool. So I kind of want to do that. Mm. In the future, I was going to sure. ask that if you'd be throwing a bit of French in your songwriting. And no, no, not yet, not yet. I haven't, but I, I will. Plan for sure. to, yeah. plan to. Yeah, I think it does sound really cool. When I was a bit younger, definitely I wasn't that interested into it. I was taking it for granted that I spoke two languages a bit. And I remember, like in high school and end of primary school, I was super like. And my mom came to school and she spoke to me in French in front of people. Like I'd be so embarrassed. I'd like stop speaking French. You yeah, know. you'd almost because, <laughs> and it's such a thing as a kid you just want to fit in yeah right so yeah, yeah. but then as you get older you realize actually no n hardly anyone else speaks a second <laughs> language this is almost That's like a epic, superpower yeah. <laughs> like i'd love to be able to speak a second language and i know i'm not gonna even claim to say that i know french but i just know like individual words or yeah, phrases somewhat, yeah enough to sort of if you're in France, you can say hello and thank you and all that stuff, obviously, mm. as most tourists would learn when they go to a different country. But to be able to fluently speak two languages is really, really cool and I think powerful in mm. some ways as well. Do you speak French at home? Yeah, with my mum. With my mum and my family in Switzerland. and every, Yeah, but not with my Australian family. Sorry, I just <laughs> want to throw in one more about the French. Yeah, yeah that's we. Legit. We. We. <laughs> The important question is when the Matildas played France at the Women's World Cup, mm. were you going for oh, France hang on. or Australia? <laughs> or you but were one of the few who weren't watching? I was not watching. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Safe answer. I don't ever watch sport ever on <laughs> Not TV. your thing. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint. If but. <laughs> there was Eurovision, Australia versus France, who would you be going would for? Would it be Australia well, I'm, versus I'm, Switzerland, I guess, Yes, it? I'm Swiss, not even. Right. Yeah. Okay. So French. France, it's the French-speaking part. It conf it's confusing. But yeah, no, that's, it's a that's ignorant on my part. I think. In fact, most Swiss are like, we don't want to be associated <laughs> with the French. So that's usually. just a relic from French colonialism way back when, and in much in the same way. Montreal, Montreal in Canada. Montreal. Yeah. Yeah. French, French Canada. But that's what I mean with my ignorance, I guess. If you were from <laughs> Montreal and you're saying you speak French, and I was like, oh, Australia versus France, and you're like, no, I'm from Canada. Well, I, I feel like, like yeah. the, the French colonizing thing kind of slips under the radar a bit, you know? And then, like, so, for example, New mm -hmm. Caledonia. New yeah. Caledonia, yeah. 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 Um, I've been there. I went there, and and then you're, like, you're seeing, you know, people walk around with baguettes and speak French, and it just seems out of place. <laughs> We're all about the English colonialism. We know all about that, but the French colonialism kind of slips under the radar in terms of, in terms of history, and then you forget how many places they went in and ruled for a bit well, you know, actually, terribly, and then, but obviously the cultural... Legacy, it's still there. 
Yeah, but I think with Switzerland, oh, it's actually so bad that I'm not even sure about this. <laughs> I should really dig more into the culture. But it's just, it is odd because it's like there's a French part, a German part, an Italian part, like oh. all Switzerland. Is that how Switzerland became the very neutral country during the war? Because that's a Maybe. stereotype. <laughs> well, like, you're like, I'm, is, I'm yeah, Switzerland, I'm, I'm not, I'm on the yeah, fence, yeah, I'm not yeah. taking a side. So These are interesting yeah. questions. It's like we're in homebrew geography, homebrew history <laughs> yeah. here, homebrew geopolitics. Yeah, people tune in for oh a music God. podcast. Yeah, oh my gosh, we're getting sidetracked. <laughs> you get more than you bargain for. Yeah, it's, we, mm. we just find it fascinating because yeah. you know, we don't speak to too many people who have <laughs> uh, the background that you do, so... Apologies if we're no, diving into a, it and boring listeners or going too <laughs> in-depth with you. But, yeah, we, we do find it interesting. Well, I mm-hmm. think they're, interesting. they're universal questions, but it does influence you as an artist, undoubtedly, in whatever, yeah. whatever you go to produce because well, that's your history. Definitely. And I listen to a lot of French songs as well. And also, like, my African side as well is influencing me a lot more now that I'm growing up. Like, definitely I'm starting to be proud and feel, feel connected to my heritage and stuff. So... Yeah, I feel a lot of like more Afrobeat type of influences lately. Um, yeah, things like that. So yeah, I'm trying to blend the free things because I feel also very connected to Australia growing up here, like most of my life. Um, so yeah, I feel connected to these free countries. So. Do you, and this is a more personal, selfish thing now, but in uni I did, uh, for we did a radio unit and one of the, it was great areas. And one of mine was what makes an Australian, Mm -hmm. right? And the arguments are citizenship or it's to do with, you know, your morals or, you know, what you're on on, on that is. But I was speaking to someone who had Polish heritage, someone who had French heritage, Mm -hmm. and I was like, do you feel Australian? And they said, in Australia, I feel French or in Australia, I feel Polish. But then when I go to Poland, I feel Australian. Yeah. Like you always feel outside. What's your take on that? I did experience that. I don't experience it anymore. I think I just don't care anymore. I'm like, whatever. (laughs) I love all, (laughs) you know. But I did. I think it was like back in 2022 when I really felt it. Here I felt like a foreigner because of my accent and people would always ask me like, where are you from? So then I just didn't feel like I belonged. And also sometimes I think the way maybe I act or speak or because I did grow up eight, eight years in Switzerland and I have a Swiss mom. So like I think some of the way I am has been influenced by different cultures um, so th- I did feel different here sometimes. And then when I go to Switzerland, I have a little bit of an English accent when I speak French. So then I feel different, you know, there, like I mm. just don't belong anywhere. But that's how I felt in 2022, 20, I think. And then I don't know what, I don't know. I think I just let go of that eventually. Like I just, I stopped caring and yeah, I feel, I feel home when I'm in the Congo. I feel home when I'm in Switzerland, I feel home when I'm in Australia. So and how good do you get awesome. three of them? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then I, I think I definitely like started to feel. I think maybe I was focusing more on the negative a couple of years ago, and then I decided to exactly like you said, like see it as a good thing, like being like, no, I'm so lucky, like that's awesome, I get to go to three different countries, and yeah, yeah. So you yeah. still have a connection to your dad. Yes, yes. Your birth father, yeah. Yes. Does he? And in terms of, of your project, uh, it's a kind of singer-songwriter-led project. What can people expect from it? And tell us about the music that you're – what are you trying to achieve with your music? What am I trying to achieve? Yeah. Oh, that's another question that I've been, like, trying to ask <laughs> myself lately because I was feeling a little bit um, – Stadium tours, documentaries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Three-and-a-half-hour cardio gigs. <laughs> Oh, man. What am I trying to achieve? I think there's been definitely, like, different phases throughout, like, my career, throughout, like, my teenage life. Because I think I've had this dream of being a singer since I'm probably about – well, since I was eight, obviously. Like, I was like, I want to be a singer. But I really started to take it, like, seriously probably in, like, year 11 or year 10, year 11. I think at first I really fell in love with performing. And then I just wanted to be on stage all the time and – you know, perform in front of people. And I just loved that feeling. I loved singing and I loved performing. But then, yeah, once I got really into songwriting and producing music and stuff, I fell in love with the process of it. And then like being able to create something that you love, I love. But then lately I've been, I was asking myself, I was like, okay, but what am I doing with releasing the music? Like, why am I releasing it type of thing? And then recently I came to a conclusion. I thought it was so cool. Some people, like a lot of people can relate to the things you say. And yeah, I think I just thought, and then I thought, oh, if I love this song, that's my one rule. Like, if I love the song that I've made, then I will release it because that's all that matters at the end of the day. It's like, if you're proud of it, then 
release it and then someone else can like it or enjoy listening to it. But I really did let go of all the expectations of like, will it become big or will it be this or will people like it? Like, I think once I, like when I started, I was a little bit in that mindset where I had expectations and dreams or whatever. And then re- lately I've really been kind of letting go of all that and just being like, no, do you like this song? You're a songwriter, you're a singer. Do you like the song? Yes, release your music because we only have one life. So, you know, what's the point of like keeping it? You know, like some people can keep it if they don't want to share it, of course. But I think I always wanted to share my music. Make it for you first and if anyone else vibes with it after that, then happy days. Exactly, exactly. But I think definitely the best thing I've done recently is just letting go a little bit of what would come from it, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, and yeah. I suppose it's if you went into anything like that, whereas like your 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 ambition is maybe I just want to get really big off it, then and, and and but when you zero back in, as you said, Cam, to to wanting to make it for yourself, mm-hmm. then then people are going to resonate with that because it's authentic to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then it's also asking yourself like what your dream is as well. Like as a musician, if you have the dream of being the next Taylor Swift, I mean, it's a I do think dream big, it's a bit hard. <laughs> but it's like, what's the point of like never being happy up until you reach that point and you might never reach it. So, and if you do, you're not going to be happy once you get to that point exactly. because there's so many things that then there's other things that you have to deal with. But like, I've really been asking myself, like, what's your dream? What do you enjoy doing? Okay, I like performing. Cool, tick. I'm doing that. I'm performing like two, three times a week. So cool, like I get to do that. Okay, what else do I love doing? Songwriting, recording, producing. Cool, I'm also doing that. I like doing sh- like you know music videos. I've done that. Like. And then you just, once you realize that, then you're like, whoa, I'm living my dream. And it doesn't matter. The rest doesn't, it doesn't matter. Because whether you're here or here, like you're still doing the same thing. I think there's just a budget difference, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But your attitude, but- I mean, across a lot of topics is is epic. I think it, it speaks to, yeah, like you, you're doing it for yourself. And, mm. and I mean, I, I'm sure Cam shares that we've had the same thoughts with, with what we do. Mm-hmm. We like doing it, number one, that's fantastic. But also if for your music, if one person has ever connected with it, if one and that would have already been achieved, then that's yeah. your, you've already impacted another stranger yeah. or another person. You've had an impact on that person. Exactly. That's doing a job. Plenty of people you know, might never have the opportunity or the confidence or whatever else to pursue those things that really drive them. Mm-hmm. And to do that in the first place, regardless of the outcome down the track, is – is an achievement and an accomplishment within itself. And then it's fulfilling too, yeah. like for your, for your soul and your heart. So Exactly. But let yeah. me just say, it, it was, I wasn't always like this. You know, I, just, I don't want to give up like, oh yeah, I've got everything to do. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm always positive. No, like it really, this is a recent thing. Probably this past year, there was a lot of ups and downs and I've had to, yeah, I guess work on myself a little bit on how I was seeing the industry and what I was doing with my life type of thing. So I think I've like recently kind of been okay with all that. If that makes sense. Was there like something in particular? Like you don't have to go into it if you don't want to. But was there something that sort of something that you can look back on and go, "It was that moment," or it was just sort of a collaboration of everything that was going on, a combination of things that that sort of formed you to go, "Actually, let's reset and think about." what I want to do yeah it's been I mean it led up because my unhappiness was getting stronger and stronger and I didn't know why because I was like but I'm leaving I'm doing everything you know that I don't want to do like everything and but I just wasn't I feeling I was feeling anxious all the time and then um I think it like happened probably in like last month I just was like okay I've got to I've got to absolutely like change my view and stuff of, of the way that I see things you know and just like and then I think I, I kind of like, yeah, I did. And then I saw my happiness level definitely increase. And just sometimes you've got to let go of some things, I think. And yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I wrote a song like recently about that, about letting go. And then um, letting go, but not only on like just to maybe your dr- like not dreams, but expectations. Um, but letting go of, oh, I wrote this song's about letting go also about um, relationships that maybe don't work out or it it's linked to a lot of different things, but anyways, I don't even know why I'm talking about it because it won't come out till next year, but I am <laughs> oh, proud of next this. Year. Yeah, but I'm really proud of this one. So, and I recently recorded it. So that's why I've brought it It's up. fresh on the mind. Yeah, it's fresh on the mind. And it is about a bit of all that stuff, like letting go of things that are just not, 
like why you're worried about that stuff type of thing. And did you find it therapeutic to actually be able to put how you've been feeling and the lessons into a song and yeah. write that and obviously record it as well? Definitely. Yeah, that's why it's on my mind. I think I recorded it um, last week and it was so, oh, it was the best feeling. Like when you're going through something and then you create a song and record it and then you have this song that's literally like how you felt or how you feel, it's just, well, there you go. That's why I love it. Most, yeah. Another, you know, go back to the second language, it's like a gift mm. that a lot of songwriters have is that they can show, you know, get their emotions out onto a bit of paper and then it translates into recording and then yeah. you're not only getting your thoughts and emotions out, mm-hmm. you're also then being creative at the same time. You're almost flexing two muscles at the same time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, and sometimes um, it's funny because like there's songs that I've written like three years ago as well where I'll listen to again and then I'll be like oh but wow I, f- I must have felt that like this three years ago but I feel like this today and then I listen to it and I'm like oh wow I, s- I can still relate to that song but then there's also songs I've written where it's like oh wow I don't relate to that anymore <laughs> so you know it- what's a better feeling when I relate to it it's a great feeling yeah because it's like because I think when I write music I'm not really thinking like I don't when I'm in the process of songwriting I just I'm not I'm not thinking I just write whatever comes to my mind so I would never really I feel like I'm almost like not really aware what I'm writing the song about like I never start writing a song being like I'm gonna write a song about this like it just always just pours out of me so yeah sometimes it surprises myself when I look at the lyrics and I'm like oh wow like I don't remember really writing this. Like, it, I don't know how to explain it. it. Just, yeah. Cool. That's a, so it's like it's it's automatic in a, yeah, se- in a it's sense. It's just it's not something that you're actively considering. It's almost it's voluntary, but it's involuntary. In yeah, it's a thoughtless. Well, the best songs that I've written are thoughtless. But then when I'm when I'm in my head and I'm like, because there's been times where I've written, you know, sat down and be like, I have to write a song because I have to, or you know, whatever. And I'm writing a song not because I feel like it, but because I think I have to. I've always read, I write the shit of songs, <laughs> horrible. But the times where I've written songs that I'm proud of, it's when I didn't feel like, like when I hadn't planned it into my day to write a song, I was just, I felt like it in the moment. And then that's usually when I, like all those singles that I've been releasing are all songs that just came out because I felt like writing a song in the moment. Do you have a self filter when you're writing these songs? So you're saying you're just writing whatever you're feeling, but do you ever go, oh, actually, no, that's a bit too you know personal that's a bit too deep I won't write that or do you write everything down and then you actually when you're either thinking about recording it that's when you're sort of actually no I don't want to include that or no I do I do it when I'm um when I'm writing the song yeah definitely because like I think most of my most of the time my process is yeah I write whatever comes to my mind like I call word vomit I just write 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 or sometimes I come up with the melody first and then I just kind of like improvise as I'm singing the melody and then I just spit out words and I take whatever works. But I never worry about how deep it is or how personal it is. And then, yeah, sometimes then when I get to record, then I kind of do have a, a scan with my friends and family and I'm like, is this okay to say or should I change this? So I do, yeah. yeah. So I do that before recording. Yeah, I was just curious because, you know, we hear it's such a therapeutic exercise to write songs, but... I was curious, at what point do you sort of stop yourself from sharing your emotions onto a page? Oh, yeah, no, I don't stop myself. (laughs) I put it all out there. (laughs) Like, that's why there's some songs that I've written where I'm like, oh, like, I want to release it, but I'm I'm like, it's so personal. But I think I am most of the time. Like, I've always been pretty open with people, as probably you can tell right now from this interview. Like, I'm not a really hard shell to break into but I think it's also because I've always kind of been comfortable like I only share things that I'm comfortable with sharing yeah obviously so I think if I share it's because I'm okay with it it's the same with my songs like there's definitely personal songs that I've written where I'm like oh if people read that like what will they think of me but then deep down if I'm really singing that means that I'm okay with that part of myself and has that always been the case or has that been part of the journey that you've been on of you know, having your own goals and being okay with who you are as a person, whether it's belonging, you know, with your Swiss background here in Australia. has Yeah, has that always been 
a, a part of your songwriting process as well as feeling okay sharing this or is the sharing of it being a part of that whole journey? No, I've always been that way, yeah. yeah. As soon as I just like started songwriting was, yeah, I've always been like that. But when I first started songwriting, I wasn't really songwriting because of the lyrics or to express how I was feeling or any of that really. I was just songwriting because I loved I loved music, but the melody, I was more connected to the melody. So I fell in love really with writing melodies first. And I was always kind of like, oh, I'm a bad like lyric writer. I always fought that. Um, and it's true, like it didn't come natural. Like the first few songs that I wrote, the lyrics were a bit cringe. And Well, I mean, I was 13, 14, so obviously there would be <laughs> cringe. I don't think melody. anyone's written a song when I was 13 <laughs> or 14 Look back at it with a 21. You know, yeah. Up. It's just no. part of it. Yeah, I don't think Justin true. Bieber goes, gee, Baby was a lyrical <laughs> masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, but yeah. Not to mention you had English as a second language <laughs> yeah. as well, which yeah. is that sort of extra barrier to songwriting. Yeah, yeah, but it, I, I think it, yeah, I improved over the years, and then only I'd say in the past two, three years, um, I really started to also fall in love with with what I was writing because I thought it was so cool. Like as I got older, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. This is personal, and this is maybe a challenge that I've lived, or this is an experience that I've had, but. I'm really like okay with putting them in songs because I really like I love it when someone writes something that I've experienced or lived or I feel like as it really when that happens when I'm listening to a singer that says something that just hits and you're like oh shit this is what I'm going through right now it just makes you feel less alone which Mm. I'm sure everyone experiences when I write something like that in my music then I'm like oh yeah well some people I know at least one person will write relate to this yeah i remember the the first heavy breakup that i had and then i was like oh i get it now because you'd hear <laughs> some song about yeah. a breakup you're like oh, i can relate to that you're like oh okay i get why yeah. people write so many songs about breakups i exactly <laughs> like i exactly um went through this recently yeah. <laughs> and then i'm like listening to all these songs and i'm like that's yeah that, now i'm like i get it now i can relate to that the okay. first song i think i can remember relating to was shut up by simple plan I don't know this song. <laughs> Can you give us a rendition? I'll, have- <laughs> it's, I'll play it for you. All I've got in my head is, um, oh, it's an old, like, I don't even know who it is. It's J-Lo era. It's like, shut up, just shut up, shut oh, up. Oh, like, that's, a, that's what I thought of when that's, you said oh, shut like up. Like I like I yeah, yeah, okay. No, yeah. Uh, Simple Plan, they're an American sort of Green Day, same sort of era. Okay. Uh, Blink-182 sort of stuff. So shut up, shut up. I was primary school. I just had sort of a mate at the time who I was just like, you know what, just shut up. <laughs> Is this person still a mate? And then, and then you were like, I love this song. <laughs> and that was sort of like, yeah, the first song, song that I think I remember. Relating. Relating to. Wow. That's the one. So what was his friend doing? Like, if we can turn the interview on to you. <laughs> yeah, what was your friend doing that yeah. was annoying you so much? He's <laughs> Zalia Pivot in the interview work. Very well done. <laughs> I'm now the guest on yeah, the yeah. Zalia Welcome. and Eamon show. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Welcome. I don't even know. I just remember listening to it probably on my disc man or something, which is a device similar to <laughs> you had a disc and a CD. <laughs> I, I think I know that. You remember yeah, this man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, so I, I, yeah. I just, I just yeah, work yeah. with someone who's like 18 years old and I say things and she's like, what? And I was like, God, the no, generational still, gap is. No, no. when I was little, like I was, my grandparents had cassettes and stuff. Yeah, so cool. I'm, hey. Yeah. Because I'm sure a lot of older people will be like, you don't even know what a cassette is. I'm like, no, I yes, do. I, I used do. to watch yeah, cassettes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I just remember, I don't know, coming home from school, frustrated that, I don't know, he was always telling me how to do things or this is what you need to do. And I was feeling like I didn't have a voice mm. and then listening to that song and it was like, yeah. In comes simple plan. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Get out of my but, face or whatever it was. And yeah. I was like, yeah. yeah, that's how I'm feeling. So that yeah. was the first song. But that's why we love music, right? Yeah. yeah. It speaks to the power of it. And it goes back to exactly what you're saying earlier about your music and what like that's that's why we love it because it helps us understand ourselves exactly. and express ourselves even as a listener. Yeah, and I've realized as well it's not only the lyrics, but like lately I've been really exploring 
how the chords like make you feel in my Spotify I literally have playlists of based on the moods well which is literally what Spotify does it like <laughs> writes but yeah I have mood playlists and and then recently I was like how does this song make you feel like this but then this song makes you feel like this and it's all the lyrics of course but it's also most of the time the chords that first give you an emotion and um and I've been really like like kind of trying to figure it out but I'm not figuring it out but like you know trying to kind of like realize why and what makes mm-hmm. a song like that that's fascinating because we spoke to a electronic artist back in our radio days mm-hmm. it was <laughs> a couple of months ago yeah it was, it was this year but he, he yeah produces electronic music where he mm-hmm. doesn't have any vocals but he's saying I'm still conveying a yeah. message and themes just through the music so it's interesting Definitely. that you've also brought up that point mm-hmm. for your music which is very I guess well, you've mixed genres with your releases so far, but you're, yeah, I guess a mixture of poppier stuff with your more acoustic singer songwriting stuff. Yeah. I wanna be forever, hold me until I'm old, be forever. I hold you if you're cold, be forever. I'll never let you go. You gotta win me with me till the Which be similar to the cover gigs that you do. I guess. Yes. So does that yeah. feel more at home to you behind a guitar? Yes. Um, no, actually. No. No, I actually preferred, like, because I also do gigs with my duet partner, Pablo. I've seen them, yeah. Yes. So him and I also do gigs around, which is awesome. And I do enjoy, yeah, no, I like sometimes just focus, focusing on singing. I'm comfortable with the both, but I do enjoy also just concentrating yeah. on the singing and... um Yeah, so I don't know. So I com- I'd be comfortable with both, yeah. And that acoustic singer-songwriter sort of, I guess, genre is what you're more at home with? Well, it, it's evolving. Like, I think that's how I started. Yeah. And then, like, you know, the the songs that I just released, Losing Myself, Be Forever, You Can Count On Me, like, they're songs that I wrote a long time ago, <laughs> which is why I feel a little bit sometimes disconnected to it because I'm like, oh, Losing Myself, I wrote four years ago, Be Forever, four years ago, You Can wow. Count Me, seven years ago. But they're also, and then in the wind is my, re, like a collaboration that I've done with Sam Hunter and Delhi Press, and this one we wrote recent, and it's completely different than my, like single other singles. But yeah, so I feel like I started as a songwriter, like definitely more singer songwriter vibe, and then now I'm like heading more. The recent stuff I've been recording is more like well, I have experienced a bit with Afrobeat, soul, R and B. It, it changes because I also wrote a song that's like super country the other day so you know I don't even know like it's people great. ask me like what do you what's your genre I'm like I don't know like a bunch of stuff well, <laughs> throw it back to Taylor Swift she's genre hopped that's true a number of times and she's still that's very true. successful so I don't I don't think in the modern era you need to be put in a box no no exactly and I have been thinking about it because I was like I've heard some people in interviews or when I've been researching about music and stuff, they always say like, you should have your, your genre so that you're easily like recognized and stuff. But I don't really, in this process, creative process, I don't think that much. Like I just do what feels right. And that's what I've been doing, I guess. So like if it, you know, if it comes out like that, it comes out like that. And I'm not overthinking it too much. And I think the way that music is released and people find music now means you don't have to be so tied to a specific no. genre and artists are hopping a lot more than they ever did because they can because you can just release music on spotify you can do this and then you can do that and it doesn't really matter people aren't listening uh to artists at, sorry to albums cohesively mm. as much anymore so there's that that's kind of the flip side of the coin the freedom to do that exactly and that that is true and like because i wasn't gonna i think i was planning at first to release an album and now i'm like maybe i'm just gonna go singles by singles because like yeah, I just don't think people would take the time to listen, you know, to 12 songs and stuff. Just just because of, like you said, the way the world works now. It's been more... And you do have a lot recorded yeah. already. So you've pretty much got an album's worth yeah, yeah, yeah. ready to go. It's just mm-hmm. now a matter of how you want to plan yes. those releases. Because we were talking to you in January, yeah. I think. And you said, I've got to release every month. Yes. Effectively. Yes. And in fact, like, I didn't release one in April because... I just mentally, like, I need a little bit of a break, I guess. <laughs> so now I'm like, I'm like, I still got those songs. So I am might be releasing them in two, maybe one month to just, like, so I can. Because I really want to fit the, I've still, I've, I've got, like, still 10 songs to release this year. So I just want to fit them in 2024. 
Mm. Because I feel like that feels right to me. So I just want to, yeah, I don't know. And it is it is hard because you know, you're doing everything yourself. So you're yeah. doing all of the social media promotion, putting up on Spotify, yeah. doing all of that sort of promotion side as well. Yeah. To do that 10 times over is a mm-hmm. lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes I feel like I'm not doing the whole marketing and promotional side of things correctly because I'm still learning. So I also want to take a bit of time to maybe b- do a bit more research and learn that side of the business. It's it's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> it's really difficult. And yeah. they yeah, things change very quickly too. Yes. Yeah. And then there's like so many when you go online, like there's so many people that are like, do this, do this, do this. Like so many people are here telling you like what they think you should be doing. But most of it, I don't know, I have tr- trust issues with some of the things people say on YouTube or Instagram because it's like... It's not a bad scepticism to yeah. have. And to a simple plan. Cause Shut up. <laughs> 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 I don't know, like sometimes, because, you know, you'll see 10, 10 things, you do these 10 things and then you'll get a million hits and it's like... It's never that easy. No. <laughs> Anyone who says it's like you just follow these three steps and you'll yeah. have all these views, it's, it's not that no. easy. No, I think there's definitely like ways that you can do to get more views or get yourself more out there. Um, but I've accepted again the fact that it's not I'm not gonna learn these things like in three months. Like it's gonna it's gonna take time of like the gigs, like the gigs it took time to build up and like the song it's gonna take time to build a fan base. In terms of your release strategy, you've just recorded a song last week that you're planning to release next year, right? Yes. And you've got so you've already got these all mapped out for the rest yes. of the year. We're only in April mm-hmm. and you already have next year's release planned. Yeah. Tell us about that process. So is this just like I've got a backlog of songs from however long ago and I need to drop them mm-hmm. in this order and everything you're recording at the moment has to come after that? Yeah, that was kind of my plan, but it might always change because I'm always yeah. changing my mind, to be honest. So like it might change. But yeah, that's kind of like what my plan was to do, which now I think – is a lot to I didn't realize how demanding it would be <laughs> when I when I planned it out and it is quite demanding because I think my head is a bit like when I'm releasing a song and I'm when I'm prom- promoting it I'm like kind of taken back into that song cuz my focus is on it and I'm creating content to promote it so then when I'm like doing that but then I'm also the next day in the studio mm. making a new song it's hard for me to feel connected to both so I feel like sometimes it's hard to do a good job with both because you just feel like half connect. Like when I'm in the studio, I like to really be connected to that song. I don't really know how to explain it. But yeah, and it's the same thing when I'm like releasing a song or creating content for it. I just, I want to feel like, feel like when I first wrote it again type of thing. So yeah, when you're doing two things at once, I've realized it can be a little bit like... You get demanding. I don't yeah, know. a bit of emotional whiplash because you're yeah. here and now you're over there, and then yeah. you got to come back to the f- an emotion and a feeling you had two years ago, which yeah. you might not feel that way anymore. But mm-hmm. you have to try and feel that again as well. Like that'll be an incredibly difficult part of the job that not a lot of people, I think, would have an understanding or appreciation for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like I, I didn't realize it would. Definitely, I didn't think I would find challenging, but yeah, I do. Some songs as well, like that I've, you know, they're all finished. You kind of, it's funny, I'm sure a lot of artists can say the same thing. When you get a song completely done, you almost like want to turn the page. I don't explain it. You just want to kind of like, yeah, I don't know. Like that's kind of what I've been experiencing a little bit. It's like, I just, okay, cool. I did it. Cool. It's like, yeah, (laughs) I don't know. Turn the page, I guess. I'm really battling mm. to believe you're only 21 based on just the amount of maturity that you are showing. Oh. <laughs> like <laughs> s- you. seriously, like your outlook on life and music and the business, like you're still very young and fresh and raw to it all, but is the way you're approaching everything and looking at everything is like you've been in the industry for 30 oh. years. <laughs> A lot of wisdom. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And <laughs> nice. and yeah, we can you can hear the product of that in your, in your music. So the yeah. latest single that you have out, you said you took April off yes. for a release. We had February. That losing myself was February. Wait, losing myself was January. Losing myself was January. And then sorry. February was Be Forever, and then there was also In the Wind collab in February, and March was You Can Count On Me. Oh, I forgot about March entirely there. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> April comes after March. No, that's okay. But yeah, so well, my, I got my next one coming out May third. I literally just like submitted it today. 
I did see yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, by the time this podcast is out, it may already be okay. out cool. into the cool, world. Cool. So if it is, look at Zalia. Forgotten. It's called Forgotten. Forgotten. And what sort of, yeah, genre? Yeah, this one's going to be more of a ballad. Hey. Yeah, ballad, a bit more of a sad song, acoustic, definitely more singer-songwriter vibe. Yeah. And where can people find all your music if they're, if they're interested? Uh, also... Your socials. Yes. Um, well, at Zalia Music, but I'll spell my name because my name is really hard to get. At Z-A-I-L-Y-A Music. That's on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. And then just my name for Spotify, Apple Music, everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And you also said this is your first ever podcast. Yeah. Which I'm also struggling to believe because <laughs> you did better than the two so-called professionals <laughs> in here throughout. Yeah. No. A couple of phone calls, punched the microphone, <laughs> coffee, knocked over a microphone, <laughs> in a co- couple of coffee kids, which I'm not, <laughs> there we go. not on cue, which I'm not, uh, Cam, you can't really be blamed for that because you can't help it, but uh, it's, uh, you, you've been great and there, there is wisdom beyond your years there. Oh, and, well, you and guys we hope are- to see that manifest in your music and your career as it <laughs> plays out. Thank you. Well, you guys are really fun to talk to. I almost forgot. Uh, I always have to remind myself that I'm being like recorded because yeah. I almost <laughs> forgot quite a few times. It just felt like we we're having a nice conversation. So that's that's, good. that's, that's not that's good. Nice for us to hear as well because that's yeah. how we want these things to sort of feel and to to be approached as well. So yeah, that's awesome. But uh, Zalia, thank you thank so you. much <laughs> for for swinging by and having a chat to us. We look forward to all the releases that are still yet to be had this year yeah. and into the next <laughs> year. I mentioned you're a prolific gigger, but you're also a prolific writer and soon to be releaser of music as well so thank you so much thank you this episode of home brewed was produced by me cameron smith it was recorded on dark and jung land at jack negro's sonora studios in tagra for more from us head to www.homebrewed.au and until next time thanks for listening for sure. And in terms of your release strategy, I find it interesting. So you, rec- <laughs> you recorded just- <laughs> <laughs> At least, I, honestly, I just, I've never laughed so much. I just slapped so that. You- <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, shut up, Mike. Um, and cut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cut. All right. <laughs> now I, um, I just had oh another phone call too. Oh, no. It's meant to be on silent, but it keeps ringing. <laughs>